Um, thanks. Um, okay, well, let, let me just start out by saying I'm obviously happy to be here. I love coming back to the University of Florida. Um, I just want to warn you all, I'm what you call a stream of consciousness speaker. It kind of, whatever comes up to my, I may not follow these charts up here, okay? Whatever pops into my head, I talk about. Um, so hopefully I'll teach you a little bit of accounting or maybe some buzzwords or terms. Don't look to me for public speaking skills, okay? I'm just telling you that up front because I tend to, tend to ramble a lot. But um, basically what I want to do is, you know, talk a little bit about Cyprus just so you know my background and it gives you a little idea of kind of what perspective I'm coming from and how I think. Uh, talk about a little bit about private real estate funds, um, what they do, the terms, how, how you know, they come about. Um, talk a little bit about the Cyprus approach and um, there's more in this presentation than I'm going to be able to cover, so I am going to move through some of the investment approach a little faster. Talk to you a, a little bit about some of our investments. And the investments I picked, I did not, you know, I can get up here and give you a very straightforward, hey, we built an apartment complex and it occupied and it sold, et cetera. I picked these five or six for less the description of the project and more there's something unique or something I liked about them or something that we did that I thought was interesting. And so it's more kind of not the description, but kind of some of the key facts about it. And then I want to talk, close with just a little bit about uh, employment and, and jobs. And not that I have a lot of uh, advice there, but, um, um, but I've got a few points. Um, I hope you can read. Yeah. OK. So as Dr. Ling said, uh, name of the company Cypress Real Estate Advisors. We are based in Austin, Texas. We actually uh, started the fund business in 95 in Houston and later moved to Austin, so we're pretty much based in the Texas. And we've raised nine discretionary funds, um, which I'll talk about and get into more detail on that. And our funds, there's a whole spectrum of funds, but our funds target value add or opportunistic type deals. Um, let, let me, I'm, gonna, I'm already gonna segue here. If I use a term, over a word, I don't know everybody's background, so I'm just kind of starting with some level of knowledge here that you don't understand or you don't know. I tell you, it's a lot better to ask me here today than to ask when you go in a job interview, okay? So one of the things is learning the words and learning uh, about different businesses, so please interrupt me if I use a term that, that doesn't ring uh, a bell with you. Um, our fund size has been anything from the first fund we raised. We raised $80 million. Uh, up to a peak of 450 million. Uh, typical fund size right now is about 200 to 250. That's what we found works best for us. And just these size parameters really don't mean much, but uh, over kind of the life of our business, we've uh, basically raised and invested about 1.6 billion of equity, which translates into, we're not a heavy, heavy leverage group, so translates into about 3.7 million or billion dollars of real estate. Um, over the course. And at any one time, if you just took a picture of our assets today, they're usually in the billion two to billion four under uh, asset or under management. And we are, you know, we're what I would consider a very small niche player in this field. Um, very briefly, this is probably hard to read, but it's just kind of a list of our funds, list of size. I don't know if this really tells you much. Um, probably the interesting thing on here is, like Dr. Ling mentioned, in the early days, we did, we over the course of the 30 years have moved some in the spectrum as the market has moved. Early on, we did a lot of uh, single family land development, uh, mixed use type product, and I'll give you some examples of that. Um, later on, we moved into really more kind of urban mixed use sites where we'd buy an old site, um, redevelop it into some sort of mixed use thing. We also owned a lot of land for a while when the market in Austin was really hot for land, we were in land. And now um, our major emphasis, and you're going to see that in the presentation, is more multifamily. We still do some mixed use, but probably the emphasis over the last five to eight years has been multifamily. Um, but that's just kind of the list of, of funds. And you can see they happen about every three years on average. And that'll come back to something we talk about later. Um, so, so real estate funds really became more prevalent in sort of the late 1980s, early 90s. And this is probably before all your time, but at that point there was a huge real estate crash, probably led by Houston, um, where basically uh, 
the government formed the Resolution Trust Corporation, which took back all the assets from all these banks that were just, you know, overburdened with debt. And so basically the funds market sort of served the purpose of putting the equity together to recapitalize the real estate market. Okay, and if you think about the fund, what a fund does is it kind of pulls a group of investors together, okay? We usually try to get investors that are, you know, have similar type objectives. We use tax exempt, uh, most of our investors are tax exempt investors. And, um, so, you know, it kind of pulls them together, pulls their equity together and allows you to basically do real estate deals. Um, you know, the, what it does for the investors, the LPs, is it allows them a more direct access or allows them access to more direct real estate not going through the public market. So it really did grow in that period of time. And they're usually structured as like a limited partnership or an LLC and, and we'll talk about some of this stuff later, but a lot of that structure is driven by tax issues and uh, liability issues government regulations, et cetera. And so, um, but what they try to do in these funds is, if you think about it, commingle a set of investors, get them all on the same page, you know, um, be careful about all the regulatory issues, and kind of their key is to align, and then we try to align our goals with their goals, okay? And so, when you raise fund capital, um, if you think about it, there's two ways to finance a re some real estate, or not just two ways, but I'm gonna compare two ways. One is a fund, like we do, and the other is deal by deal. And in each case, there's positives and negatives. So let me run through it real quick. In a real estate fund, what's really great about it is I go out one time and raise $150 million. So my LPs do a fund level set of diligence, okay? They, um, you know, it's, it's a one-time process. The capital, once it's in that fund, it's discretionary capital. So it's discretionary, and all funds are not discretionary, so I, that's a very key point. But those funds are discretionary to me, which allows me to pick the deals I invest in and to close very quickly if necessary. And that's actually a competitive advantage, the ability, the fact that you have capital there ready to go. I mean, that to me is the, the key thing to a fund. Okay, now the negatives, oh, I, I forgot. And there's ongoing asset management fees, which I'll get back to. You know, in real estate, fees are important. You gotta survive waiting for the deal, okay? So in a fund format, you have ongoing asset management fees to support your organization. So I, I put that last, but that's actually a very important uh, issue. The negatives are the financial terms are not as good in a fund. If you think about it, those, LPs are giving you upfront money, you're making the decisions, and they're making your life easier. So where the back-end participation of your entity uh, in a deal might be, I don't know, 30 or 35%, the typical fund, the back-end's 20%. So the financial terms are not um, as rewarding, actually, as a deal-by-deal -deal thing. But that's in return for all those positives. Um, and then even more critical, is a fund, all your deals are commingled. Does everybody know what you mean when I'm saying when I say commingled? So if I have nine winners, nine winners and one loser, okay, that loser pulls the profit out of those nine winners. In other words, everything is, at, is commingled together and the returns are calculated at that level. So it's very important in a fund to not have that devastating investment. I mean, the, that commingling, everybody always glosses over things like that until you see it happen, where you've worked all this time with some really strong investments and one bad investment hurts you. So let me flip over to the deal to deal, which is sort of, if you think about it, a lot of the positive and negative is the opposite. You get better terms on a deal by deal, deal, because the investor gets to look at that specific deal, okay? And therefore they feel more comfortable and they give you better terms. Um, the, so the things are, are more, basically your terms are, are more favorable. Um, the fees that you get out of a deal by deal thing are usually, you, you get more than asset management fee. You'll get acquisition fees, you'll get management fees, you'll get 
what else do I have in there? Disposition fees. So you got more fee sources there, okay? But it's only at the deal level. So those are kind of positives there. The negatives are every deal you got to go raise capital. What happens when you have a deal that needs to close in 30 days? You're out raising capital. It's very difficult. You can't, you basically can't do that deal, okay? Your investor wants to do due diligence. So you have somebody looking over your shoulder on every single deal. So it's a much more painful process. And so therefore it's just a longer term, uh, time to close transactions. Over the years, we as Cypress Real Estate Advisors, we keep going, this fun thing has really worked, but you know, it'd be great to do some deal by deals. So there's no clear answer to that, which you'd choose. Um, uh, it, it's just kind of where you fit in the market and who your investors are. Okay, when you write in the fund process, it's fairly straightforward. It's very painful, but it's fairly straightforward. Just like you'd think, you know, we basically have to come up with a set of documents, presentations, road shows, office visits, you know, it's a long time frame. Raising money for a fund, uh, even with existing investors that you know, it's a six month process. Usually it's closer to 18. So there's a lot of upfront process in the fundraising, um, uh, you know, just the whole time frame. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over the documents. Basically, you put together a private. Go ahead. Go ahead. So you said that your uh, investors were mainly endowments. And yes. So in your first fund, how did you, I guess, convince them to give you capital? Well, it, um, it's always a tough question other than we had a relationship with one endowment. Got them on board. I mean, it's kind of what you'd expect. You, you get the first one on board, okay, through a relationship. And... Um, Basically, then it's, it's kind of that word of mouth, you know, pounding the pavement. I mean, it's a, pound, it's a cold calling, pound the pavement business. But the, the first one is so hard. It's all, it is very difficult in today's environment to be a first time fun group. I mean, going out there and because, number one, there's so many. You remember in 1995, there weren't quite as, few, quite as many of us. So basically, we got an initial one on board. And then basically what you do is it's a leverage off that I've got so-and-so, and it did help that Harvard Management Company was our first investor, so it's like I got them on board. And so our first four investors, we had Harvard, Princeton, Vanderbilt, and Rice. Okay, so we had four investors, and it was about $80 million. Then with each additional fund, you basically build off that. And if you think about it, these investors, just like in any business, they know each other, you know, the person at Rice knows the person at Vanderbilt, and so it becomes word of mouth. You can use placement agents. We have never used a placement agent. Um, number one, you gotta pay for them, and number two, we've just been able to use that word of mouth. Um, and so over the years, we actually peaked at about 24 investors with fund six, and then we moved, in our current fund, we have nine investors, and it actually was a decision by us to ramp that down and require a more, a larger, we want to go larger minimum, fewer investors, just as you get a little older, you get tired of all the administration. <laughs> um, what is it? $20, $20 million, and we'll, we'll get into that. But um, so it, it really is a kind of word of mouth, and the bottom line is, you know, fun, oh, so I was acting like I had my funds up there. Fund one's got to perform to raise fund two. Fund two's got to perform to raise fund three. I mean, it's a very performance-driven uh, business, and so that's kind of... Um, Anyway, when managers are looking at, at you, they're gonna look at what your strategy is, we're value add, we're opportunistic, um, what your prior experience is, what your, it's funny, everybody always belittles us, what your backroom operations are. They wanna know that you have an accounting shop and a financial reporting shop and that you can support the administration really. To, and new funds always struggle over that because they can't afford the overhead, if you think about it. So, um, back, and then kind of where your product and geographic expertise is. So it's just kind of a vetting process during that. During that. Um, so I tried to put down some typical partnership uh, fund terms. There are no, let me just start with that, there are no terms. I think Dr. Ling would probably argue a few of these terms. <laughs> but um, um, We stay in the 250 to 500 million. Blackstone, what do they raise? 10 billion a fund? I don't even know what they raise anymore. But for the size of our shop and our strategy, which we'll talk about, that's what we can, I mean, we found the 450 was too much, okay? That is the perfect size for us. GP commitment's usually about 5%, so the home team 
has to put in 5% of the dollars. So if you invest, you know, if you've got a $200 million fund, you've got to put in 10 million, they just want you to have skin in the game, just like you'd think. Um, the term usually is 10 years with two one-year extensions. Sometimes they're eight, but these are, these are pretty typical. You have four years to spend it. Okay, so you got a four-year commitment period to, to put, place the money. At the end of four years, you're not allowed to new, do new deals. You usually can call additional capital, but you can't do new deals. Okay? And then, um, but somebody said, so what's the typical term of your deal, 10 years? Typically what we want to see is a life of a deal being five to six years. So if you think about it, you got a four-year time frame to invest, you got five to six-year deals, some of them go in the first year, some of them go in the third year, and that kind of works within a 10-year time frame. That I also mentioned in, to the earlier group, unfortunately, we've had some 10-year deals. What you find is your good deals go really fast, and your bad deals stick with you forever. <laughs> Okay, and it's not just the fact that your bad deal is a bad deal, it's that the time and effort that continues to go into that bad deal hurts more than the financial side of it does. Um, management fees, go ahead, go ahead. What's the advantage to the LPs for investing in discretionary funds? Well, I mean, a lot of the big, and it's funny because some of them have been in the deal, uh, have been in the fund and got out of the fund business. So it really depends on, it's a entity by entity or a, LP by LP decision. Harvard's not really in the fund business anymore, okay, and the other ones that got started. But it's basically a way to sort of invest directly in real estate without, not, without having the person power. I mean, they don't have to staff up to do it. If you think about doing direct real estate investments in an endowment fund, they basically have to layer in a whole organization to invest in real estate, asset manage it, watch everything. So basically, if you think about it, what they're doing is they're outsourcing. Okay, and what comes with that is obviously some of these fees. The discretionary versus the non-discretionary, when we, when we raised our first little piece of capital prior to our first fund, it was not discretionary. In other words, Harvard wanted to look at it. Okay, with the first fund it became discretionary. And, um, you know, again, you know, just one second, if you get back to not, it being non-discretionary, then they've got, got to look at every deal. In fact, our investors have the opportunity to co-invest with us, most of them, some of them will do it, some of them don't because they don't have the person power to look at every deal. So it's basically outsourcing. Go ahead. Is that GP commitment just specific to your fund or is that kind of across the board? You know, it, it, I'm giving you a rule of thumb there. Mm -hmm. Our first fund, we put in 2% because we didn't have any money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, the bigger the fund gets, it, it can vary greatly. I'm just saying on average, they're usually, and, and in fact, our latest fund, it was 5% up to a certain amount, and then after that, so there's variation. Every term I've given you here, there's a variation, okay? But they, I think they always feel like 5%, you know, and they also, you know, they look at the, the manager, the GP, and say, what will be painful for you? I mean, that's really the decision if you think about it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> did, did you did you teach your paper in course? Yeah, you took it. Yeah. Dr. Lang sent me a paper on that opportunity cost. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, I would say things you have to think about in that. No, we basically they make the commitment, okay? And so let's say I rate we raise two hundred million dollars, and we have four years to spend it. We can call it actually we can call it over the four we can. can do new deals over the four years, but we can call it a little bit after that. So in theory, you could say, oh, well, so are they sitting on the sideline with their capital? Well, number one, they do a bunch of funds. They have to have a cash balance anyway. So I don't think you can do a direct calculation of what the opportunity costs. I mean, think about you as a personal real estate investor. If you invest, you get a 20% and then it's on the sideline six months waiting for the next deal, you know, there's opportunity costs. So there's definitely opportunity costs. They ha there have been, in a couple of our funds, they squeeze the commitment down to three years. So they try to squeeze it down. Um, the other thing related to that is the management fee, which is, I'm going to tie back to your question. It's a point and a half. I can tell you in our latest fund it was 1.35. So they're squeezing down the management fees some. In one of our funds, they paid us a 0.5 fee committed but not invested committed but not funded, okay, to try and reduce 
but there's still, an, I, I, I move from management fee to opportunity cost, but I guess what I'm trying to say is they're trying to squeeze that whole, you know, they've got cash sitting on the sidelines and how long does it sit and, and they're not going to pay us for much if we lag it out. Of course, I'm not sure they want to incent us to put money out faster than it should be put out in any particular market cycle too. So, I mean, there's a bunch of things, but in theory, most of these guys, I would say most of these guys invest in a lot of funds. So they don't look at our fund and say, okay, I'm going to put 20 million in this fund. I got to put 20 million on the sidelines. It's across funds. They got to have cash anyway. Um, we only have to give them 10 days notice for a draw. So in theory, they do have to have cash available. So there might be opportunity costs, but I think that's true of any kind of real estate investment. Go ahead. Can you maybe talk about one of the times where you thought that this may not work versus, you know, okay, this is going to be a, a home run, kind of that, that low versus the high since real estate sick, but we're all going to experience that. Any lessons learned? Uh, I'm not sure what, uh, I'm not sure. Like your question. Over the course of these funds, you've been through recessions, you've been through oh. hot markets, highs and lows. Are there times where you thought like, okay, I might lose it and okay, this one's a home run? Yeah, okay, so um, <laughs> there's a lot to say about that. That's a good, but a great question. <laughs> Think about being in the fund business. I'm gonna get right off topic here, but I love doing this. Um, think about being in the fund business. You usually have a three fund cycle. I'm gonna start at even higher level. So one, you're investing. One, you're sort of uh, managing, trying to improve the value, okay? And uh, two, and then the last one, the third one, you basically are harvesting and selling. So if you always wanna be in the fund business, you're always going to be buying, holding, and selling at the same time. But you've got cycles in there. So, you know, there is uh, the whole, and what it does to a certain degree is slow down implementation of certain funds, slow down selling others. So you, but if you want to be in the real estate business, you have, to, you have to work in all cycles. You don't, I mean, and so, you know, you do have to pay attention to the different cycles and actually, we thought the fund where we gave them the, the 0.5 fee, number one, we had some other funds that were generating enough fees to cover the organization. We thought we were gonna put out slow. So we gave them a fee break so that the fee didn't overwhelm the return of the fund. Because we went into that fund going, this is gonna be a slowly deplo deployed fund. So you try and manage that, but I'm not sure you can completely manage that. And some funds, uh, this might be what you're referring to when we talk, Funds five and fund six, unfortunately for us, they went out when the market was really, really hot and things were, all the prices were high, okay? And we had more investors than we need, knew, needed to have. We actually had to turn some investors away from that fund. You know, market's hot, everybody wants to invest, so you're buying high and unfortunately then market tanks in 08, 09, and you're trying to harvest those funds and it's pretty rough. Fund seven, we raised in 09, we were begging for money. The only money we could get were from, now I'm giving you basic facts of a business here. <laughs> you're basic, you're uh, begging for money. No, everybody's a, afraid to invest. So we went back to existing investors and said, you know, just kind of roll over with us, give us some money. We didn't get a single new investor in fund seven. Fund seven's had the highest return of any of our funds because it was in a down market. We got lucky and raised the money. It went out at the right time and the market went like this. So you, you, you know, you have timing issues across all that. Go ahead. I think the fact that you said they're at different stages of, of, uh, all the time, is that what helped kind of neutralize during those times, the fact that each fund was kind of at a different stage? Or you have to well, the problem is you're, you're not trying to neutralize. Right. <laughs> you're, you're trying every fund to produce. I, 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 literally, I mean, it is, uh, it very is a business of what have you done for me lately. <laughs> So it, it just, it's a tough fact of the business. So you manage, I mean, yes, it does neutralize some of that, but you're, you're still trying to, go ahead. When you were investing in land, would you just rely on the value appreciation? Or you, you know, like you know and what happened was in fund four, we bought a bunch of land to, to basically a lot of it was in downtown Austin um, that we thought we were going to develop. And we, also, oh, we had a piece of land in West Palm Beach we thought we were gonna develop. And basically, the market was on such a momentum up that you basically looked at it and you said, okay, I can make X if I develop it, or I can make Y if I sell the land, and I don't have to incur the risk for that increment. And so we always called uh, Fund 4 our land fund. We, we don't typically buy land to buy land. We buy land to either improve entitlements or build. But we call that our land, 
uh, on the thing. I think it actually said land because it, but that was just the market that drove that. Okay, anything else? Keep asking questions. I'll, I don't mind if I only get halfway through the presentation. Uh, what do I got next? Okay, Cypress investment approach. I'm going to try and move rapidly through this. Um, geography, like we said, we are Florida, Texas, Colorado being Denver. We actually, some of the younger folks who are now managing some of our business are moving a little bit to the, to the Pacific Northwest. But, you know, we, you're going to see this on about three slides. We like, we are job growth, job growth, job growth. I mean, we just believe this, that if you're in a market with job growth, it drives residential, it drives office space, it drives, it drives everything. And we look for markets that we consider to be sort of, you know, highly educated, which is a lot of the tech force, to, you know, these days and everything. And um, we tend to, the, the second point there, protected and or, most of, we don't build apartment complexes in the suburbs. All of ours are, tend to be more urban, infill, a little more competitively protect, protected, harder to get the up entitlements, et cetera. So, you know, we have a geographic focus product. Like I said, we have moved, it's moved over the years, but right now it's multifamily and mixed use. That was one thing I had to change about this presentation. It was interesting to see, um, you know, just kind of that we really have moved in that uh, direction. Um, totally a local presence. I mean, we stay in a limited number of markets because we think it's a totally a local business. We would never go to Chicago. We'd never go to San Francisco. You got to be on the ground. Our type of thing where we're an operator, we develop, we operate. You know, you got to be in the, in the market, know the land deals, know what's coming up, you know, understand the local politics. So it's just a local business. The value investors just that, you know, we, there's usually some elbow grease in any of our deals. We don't really, you know, you get the lucky land deal or something, but we don't, we're not a momentum investor or a financial engineer or anything like that. Um, and risk. We always get back to risk. We tend to look at things, if I got a chance of making a 20 or losing a 20, I'm not going to do it. I want to, if not zero on the bottom end, I want to be no more, you know, a capital loss in our book is, we consider that a tragedy. We want to be a, 50, a zero to a 15. So we focus really heavy on mitiga uh, mitigation of risk. And in there, there's, you know, everybody always talks about market, mar market risk. Let me tell you, there's partner risk, there's just uh, environmental risk, governmental risk, construction risk, there's all types of risks. So, you know, we have always taken the approach of, of somewhat being risk averse. That's tough in the real estate business. Um, this, I think this is almost a repeat. Some of this came, came out of our pitch book to investors, um, you know, just of direct sourcing of being local, okay, high growth markets. Fund five, I think the brokerage business is a great business. In fund five, we did like 10 or 12 deals. Not one deal was a brokered, marketed deal. Every deal was locally sourced. Uh, Lakeshore, which we're going to talk about, tax map. My brother and one of the guys in the office went across the tax map, picking out parcels, calling <laughs> owners, and, you know, uh, trying to get hold of land tracts. So, you know, it's kind of that local, uh, get your fingers or get your hands dirty kind of business. Um, I'm trying to move quickly through here. You know, active management. Modest use of debt. We'll use debt up to 65 or 70% on a stabilized asset. Some of our assets are land assets. But... There's actually debt limits in some of our fund documents. We don't even get close to them. We tend to be on the lower debt side because liquidity is so important. Um, multifamily, like I said, we go ahead. So when you're looking for um, stuff to acquire in like a new market, so you know, the Pacific Northwest, and it's all off-market stuff, like how do you find out about these opportunities? Like, do you have just relationships in that market that you kind of ask around? Or well, I mean, when we were, we've now been in Denver since 06. We, we had, we probably were looking at Denver for three to four years before we did our first deal. Okay, so we're very slow to move into markets. Um, we usually will move someone there to get in. And you start with the brokerage community, I mean, you do. That's how you hear about deals. That's how you kind of get, you know, look at all the marketed stuff. Um, so I guess what I would tell you is it's really just all about forming the relationships, getting in the middle of things, watching what's going on, making the cold, making the cold calls, um, and being patient about it. If you think about it, 
you know, we all buy our houses. When you buy your first house, you, man, that second house is the house you've got to have. No, there's about 50 other houses that'll work. And so you have to be very patient when you go into a new market. We're very slow. And that's why we've stayed so true to kind of our Florida and Texas and Colorado markets. So, you know, there's no perfect approach. I'm just telling you it should be very slow and you've got to get into the market. You can't do a market from a, we don't believe you can do a market from a different city. Lots of groups do it. So I'm just, remember, I'm giving you my opinions. <laughs> they might all be incorrect. <laughs> Is it somebody? Um, go ahead. Oh, I think you compete with a little bit of everybody. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's really, you know, you look at a market like Austin, there's the public REITs are in there, the private guys are in there. Um, and it, you never really, uh, I think in most big markets, it's not like, hey, there's these five competitors. Competition in real estate is just across the board because it's everything from one man or one person shops to the big REITs that are in there buying assets up. Now, we tend to buy things that are a little messier, that have issues that need to be up entitled. We don't, we don't take on full entitlement risk, but we make sure that whatever's entitled will work. But we try to up entitle. Well, some of the bigger organizations don't want to spend all that time. And that's why our funds are smaller, is because you, know, it's, you try to buy something messier, you try and buy, we bought a track of land downtown Austin we had been looking at for four or five years in eight days. That's the, that's the benefit to having a fund. Eight days, we had the capital, closed the doc, deal. So you, you, you work for things that you have a little bit of a competitive advantage on. Go ahead. What do you mean by up and title? Well, I mean, any track of land will typically um, have some set of entitlements, whether it's zoned for office or commercial. Um, Lakeshore, which I'm going to talk about, it had a set of uh, entitlements for a uh, multifamily complex, and they had been there. In fact, they had been UT student housing way back in the 70s. We basically went in and got a planned unit development put on a, and so you entitled it where we could build commercial. In fact, Oracle bought it from us, and they got a million square feet of, land, of office on it now. So you're basically just increasing the density and, and or the product you can develop. Um, so multifamily, we moved into it probably in 2012. We, we had had rehab multifamily and multifamily investments, but you'll see some numbers. We moved into it pretty heavy on the development side, and we've just seen that it's a real growth market right now. Um, there's a lot of demand, the demographics, the movement towards, especially in Austin, a lot more folks uh, being the percentage of rent versus own has obviously changed. I'm sure you all have learned that in school. but. Um, the urbanization, everybody wants to live, move in that urban environment. And so, um, you know, we've found that it's been a very successful run and we've put in a lot of emphasis on it. And that kind of lends, if you think about it, lends us to those markets we want to be in where there's a lot of job growth, filling up those, a lot of in migration, um, you know, a smart young crowd that not ready to buy a home. And, and so we really have made a, a, a push into, um, the multifamily products. Um, in fact, here, I, I just want to kind of put it in perspective. So basically, in the life of our organization, we've owned 21,000 apartment units. So we're not, we're not big. Um, we've acquired about 11, and we've developed 10,000 units. And right now, th this is really more to give you a picture of how big a, or, you know, or how small a company we are, the size of our company, the better way to say it. Right now, we've got seven projects in development, about 1,700 units. and. You can see those are in Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, um, in Denver, and we've got three in design. So typically we're kind of on a 10 project cycle. It, it gets faster sometimes, it gets slower. We're a little nervous right now, so we're, we're kind of watching it. But that, that's really more just to give you kind of a size and, and show you the push that we've made into multifamily over the last few years. Um, I'm gonna skip the slide because I think I've covered everything on it. Uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so you said you're nervous right now, why do you say that? Well, I, I think you've seen a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a slowing down, calming down of the multifamily business. You know, rates were booming a few years ago. In Austin, I mean, they were really off the charts. In Denver, they were really off the charts. You've seen uh, Austin kind of went flat a little bit. Now it's kind of tweaking back up. Denver's, or Dallas is a little slow right now. So I think you've seen a little bit of just nervousness over rates. 
A um, little bit of nervousness over supply, though. You know, Denver, they say, oh, the supply's heavy. I don't know, the job growth is outpacing the, the supply. So um, there's not quite as much the, the feel of the sales. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Three years ago, you had 20 offers and six would make the best and final and the rates were, you know, cap rates were way down and, and you just felt like it was very, very frothy. I'm not so sure it's as frothy right now. And, you know, that's always, everybody always asks me about cap rates. I don't really have an opinion on cap rates other than I think they could, I don't think they've changed that much today, but I would tell you that the underwriting that goes into that calculation has changed from what it was three years ago. So if you change your NOI because you underwrite it tougher, okay, and then it uses the same cap rate, it wouldn't surprise me if cap rates tweak up a little bit. In fact, I think we're making a lot of decisions right now. NOI's X, can we improve it? In fact, I got a project in San Antonio we were just talking about yesterday. What's gonna happen to the NOI next year? And you say, oh, NOI's gonna go up. This much of a change in cap rate will wipe out all that value. You know, cap rates go up, all that work on improving the NOI gets wiped out. So you're kind of making that decision of, do I feel comfortable that I can improve it beyond what a cap rate change? So we all think it's going to tweak some. I don't think it's going to be disastrous. And I don't think it's really changed that much. I mean, there are apartment deals changing, or changing hands on low four cap rates. And if you really looked at the math, it might even be lower than that right now. So. I, you know, but I don't, uh, that's a tough question. It's like, our interest, where are our interest rates going? I don't know, <laughs> okay? The, the other thing that's making multifamily very difficult is, I need, to, I need to speed up here, but the cost side of multifamily is just, costs have gone up so much. Construction costs, um, I mean, so you're really saying, are the rates gonna keep going up enough to support the higher cost of construction? I mean, it, it's jumped just incredible amount. So that, it's just kind of slowed down the process, I guess, is the best way. When I say why, why are we a little nervous? Okay, go ahead. So when it comes to construction costs, I mean, I, I think really everybody who has a chance to interact with it, like especially in the multifamily space, has mentioned the construction costs being out of control is like a big reason everything's slowing down. Is there anything being done to fix that? Like construction hasn't changed much in you know, the, the problem is you look at it and you go, oh, well, it's materials. It's lumber and concrete. And because a lot of, all of our stuff structured as a concrete garage and maybe a podium. Um, is kind of, and then you go, oh, I don't know, it's labor too. I mean, labor in Texas and, you know, they can attribute it to Harvey in Houston or they can attribute it to tougher immigration or they can, you know, there's a thousand things. But, you know, there's no... Uh, changes in technology, and I shouldn't say it, there are changes in technology, that's a bad statement. I'm not betting on a change in technology to bring that cost down in the near future. So that's my best thing, but I mean, it's just, you know, some of it's just labor shortage, material shortage, the other is when multifamily got hot in the beginning, the subs took it more on the teeth, they couldn't charge as much. Well, now they can, and they're doing it. And, you know, everybody's gotta make a profit, and then that rolls into the GC, and so, but I mean, we've had projects that were built one after the other, and you had a 30% change in cost, projects right next to each other in Austin in the span of 18 months. I mean, it is a significant thing, and, um, and you bid it, and, it, and it's, I mean, it's a cost of really skyrocketed. And I don't see any, we don't see any short-term solution, and you know, it's a lot, fa it goes up a lot faster than it comes down. It's very sticky coming down. Anyway, there was another question, no? Um, okay, let me, let me run through these real quick. Uh, and like I said, I picked these out for, just because I wanted to, the key points column, not the description. So Longwood Village, I, I talked to a group earlier, this was my first real estate project, and I just love it. So that's why I'm telling you about it, okay? <laughs> um, it was a land development. It's kind of what got my brother and I's company kind of going, okay? So it's nice to have a successful project, but I would tell you sometimes 5% brains, 95% timing. We hit Houston in the 90s, residential market went from crash to boom, projected to be a 12-year deal, ended up being a six-year deal or a 10-year deal. So you, 
But the thing I loved about this project, so quick description, 1,435 lots, all horizontal infrastructure. We don't build homes, we sell lots of buildings. Um, so basically streets, water plant, sewer plant, all the utilities, golf, 27 hole golf course, uh, rec centers. So just, you can imagine that landscaping, entry features, all that kind of stuff. The reason I love this project is because when I started it, I worked with, uh, let's just start being, I closed the deal, so I worked on all the title issues, mineral issues, um, basically raised the money for it, so I worked with the bank and the financings and the draws. I worked with the land planner, the landscape designer, the civil engineer, the contractor, the landscape contractor, the golf course designer, the golf course construction. I even approved the marketing ads in the newspaper, and I can promise you I have no marketing skills, no advertising skills. And I think this is just a classic why you want to be in real estate, because if you can ever work on a project where you do that many different things, it is a great job. And I mean, it takes a while to get there, okay? You're not gonna start there, but it has so much diversity and so many different skill sets required. And so I always look back at this and go, it was just so much fun to work on so many different things on a project. And that's why I always tell real estate's just great, okay? Abacoa, this, this is our, what we would call our flagship project. It's actually in Jupiter, Florida. It's 2,000 acres. Again, we did the horizontal infrastructure, um, built a baseball facility and a golf course, um, basically sold land parcels here so we didn't build homes again. Uh, was truly what they call that TND neighborhood, and this was in 96, so back probably about when y'all were born. That was before TND was cool. Um, in fact, Celebration was probably the only true one. And it was actually a joint venture with a foundation that foundations aren't allowed to develop because they're tax exempts and they needed a developer. So we developed it for them. And it was basically the most interesting thing is we only put $8 million in it and it was financed with $74 million of district bonds. And the guy that worked on this project for us basically put in about $70 million of infrastructure in two years. So again, and this has been, I mean, it was very successful. So it's just, but it, kind of an exciting project for us. And I put it in just because it's kind of our flagship project. I'm not sure everybody knows what the term multiple is. Multiple? Okay. 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 Basically, uh, funds look at, when we first started funds, I'm going to back up a little bit. When we first started funds, everybody always looked at the IRR. And it was like, you know, what return am I getting on my money, right? Over the, the years, it has migrated to a combination of IRR and multiple. And now I'm not gonna give a technically right, correct description of multiple, but multiple to me is how many times your money did you get back, okay? And, the, and what's important about multiple is if you give somebody, give them a 30% return, and it's a one year deal, okay? Their multiple is gonna be 1.3, right? They put in 10 million and they got 30% back in theory. Three, I'm, I'm doing very simple math here. My agent's gotta get simple. You know, they get three million, so they got, 1.3, the absolute dollars is 3 million. These funds nowadays, and it ties back in, I think a little bit into your opportunity cost thing, they'd rather have, instead of the 30% multiple, they'd rather have a 18% multiple that goes five or six years, and I can't do the math on that, because, what? 18%, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, 18% IRR for, instead of having a 30% IRR, they'd rather have an 18% IRR for six years. Because if you think about it, the absolute dollars, so the 10 million they put in comes back as, I, can, I really can't do that, do the math in that. But, but basically it's absolute dollars, so they're not, so basically I just look at it as it's basically the multiple of the equity you put in, what do you get back, okay? Um, there was some comment I was gonna make. We always look for, uh, kind of our rule of thumb, which I think rule of thumbs are really important. We look for deals that earn a 20% IRR with a, at least a 2 ohm multiple, okay? So if you think about it, then it's gotta be about four to five year life. If you earn 20% compounded every year, it'd be a little over 2 ohm multiple. And that, that's kinda rule of thumb what we want to hit. I mean, we want better, but that's where you go. So, um, everybody kinda understand the concept of multiple? Dr. Ling will do a better job telling you what it is in class one day. <laughs> go ahead. So when you sell off these uh, individual house uh, parcels, 
still have the golf course and the clubhouse and all those things. How long do you, I guess, still have ownership over those before you sell those off? It varies. So in Longwood, we sold, that's the thing, we sold individual lots. In Abacoa, we sold parcels of land, and then the home builder would come in and put the in, internal infrastructure. We owned the Longwood golf course. We're not golf course guys. I always worry when I say stuff like this if somebody's in the golf course business or family's in the golf course business. It's just not our kind of business. It's a tough business, is one of the truth. And so we, we built that golf course in 95 and we sold it in 98. And really all you were trying to do was get the lot premiums on the golf course. Now we actually did make some money on the golf course, not a huge amount, but we made some money. But typically you're just doing it. Abaco, we actually sold before we opened. So that shows you we're not golf course business people. We, we, want it, we want the lot premiums, we don't want the golf course operations. And there's you typically not, especially in today's world, back in the 90s you used to be able to make a little bit of money, but not much. The golf course is just like a vehicle to make the house move Yep, that's exactly right, exactly right. And then literally what you do is you end up with a homeowners association or a property owners association that you bundle all the park land and all that stuff in and push it out the door, okay? Um, oh, oh, Lakeshore. This was a classic example of up entitlement. It, it was old rundown apartments on Lake Austin. See uh, downtown Austin in the background there? And um, you had, this is the end of Lake Austin, or Lady Bird Lake as they call it. We built that complex and that complex. Oracle has 500,000 square feet there and is building another building in process, kind of, uh, I guess you said there was a whatever, but kind of in that, or a laser, but I don't know how to work it. So in that middle track. But this is a classic example where it was underutilized, low-density apartments, so you could buy the land, you could buy the apartments at a, a basis that worked for land. And so we bought the land, demoed the, now, there's a little bit of a gentrification issue here, but that's for a different story. Um, but uh, anyway, redeveloped that land, and we bought it because it was close to downtown, but had sort of an urban feel. And, what ended up happening was basically we built the first two, sold the first apartment complex, and then sold the second apartment complex and all the land to Oracle in 2015. And this is their, gonna be their Houston, or their Austin headquarters. And this is probably the biggest, most exciting sale I ever was involved in. They wanted the land. Larry Ellison came in and said, we want this land. <laughs> um, okay, city center, the reason I wanna talk about this is Talk about risk mitigation. We invest anywhere in the capital structure based on the deal. These guys came, it was an old mall. They came into us looking for equity. We were nervous about how they were valuing the project. We thought, we don't want to be the equity in this deal. We want somebody else's equity to be at the far end, so we gave them a MES loan, okay? But we had, and the MES loan was like at, I think it was, did I put it in there? It was 16 or 17 percent, so it's very expensive money. But we attached to that that one five acre parcel, we had the option to buy at the basis that we went into it, that, the, that everybody went into it after they had developed it. So basically it turned that 16% return into a 34% return because the project was incredibly successful. All we did was option the land, turned around and flipped it. So we basically had a MES loan with a, a land option kicker. And we've done that two or three times and it really works well. Because if you think about it, if the project's not that great, you're lower in the structure, you get your 16%. If it's really great, you've, you're in there at the basis that the deal started, and we flipped it to an apartment developer. So just kind of a different thought process on deals. Um, I'm going fast now, sorry folks. Um, Aberdeen's actually in Jacksonville, south of Jacksonville. Here, we didn't buy the land, we bought the defaulted CDD bonds. CDD bonds are community development district bonds, okay? And basically they're floated to, and I'm trying not to be too complicated here, but I'm just trying to show you different avenues to get into things. Basically those bonds are floated to, to put the infrastructure in and then the houses are, or the landowners are assessed or taxed, whatever you want to call it. The bonds were in default because the community didn't grow fast enough. So we bought the bonds at something like 40 cents on the dollar, they were defaulted, basically, then got some of the parcels with a deed in lieu, turned around and sold that land and got the, re the development going again, so then those bonds became valuable again. So here, we bought bonds, we didn't buy land, okay? So there's a lot of avenues in real estate, is my point. But the reason we felt comfortable with this is we had issued CDD bonds at Julington Creek, which is another project in Jacksonville, if anybody lives in Jacksonville. 
so we had issued the bonds, we had developed land, so we felt like we understood the two sides of the deal, okay? Um, Corazon, it's nothing but a multifamily deal. I thought I'd put it in one really simple deal. It's on the east side of Austin. This is, uh, the Austin has grown really quickly to the east, uh, east of 35. 35 goes right up through the middle of Austin. Historically, the east side has been the uh, lower income, tougher demographic side of town, and, and all of your generation is moving over there. And so we got in early. We had trouble getting equity to do this deal because we were raising some side-by-side -side equity with ours. Had trouble getting a bank to do it. And it's basically about five blocks east of downtown. And basically, it was just early in the area's development. And... Um, you know, but, but surrounded by a lot of good things in the city. And so it's kind of that whole thing of trying to find the small, the site in a growing area um, that, you know, and being a little bit ahead of the curve and uh, was a very successful project for us. Okay, now I want to show you Indian Shadow. I want you to, I want you to focus in on that IRR <laughs> and that multiple, yeah. okay? Sean, who's one of the, is a woman in my office who's one of the principals with us now, she goes, why are you putting that in there? <laughs> I just think there's a great lesson in this. Market was really, this is a second home residential deal in D D Durango, Colorado, okay? We don't do second home deals, okay? So market was hot, partner brought it to us, it sounded great. Okay, we invested in it. So the lesson here is, so the key point there is horizontal land infrastructure, that's just telling you. It was a hot market with a new partner, new product, new geographic market, total lack of discipline, and big loss of capital. That's what happens when you get outside over your skis. And this is our classic example. And just to, to, so when I, we got done with this hat, I had this Indian, in fact, I lost it at a Gator game. I had an Indian shadow black baseball hat that I really liked. And I always told everybody, that was a $13 million hat. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, really, the, I mean, this was really a great deal. I mean, it just was wonderful. And it just shows you, just one second, when, you, when the market gets hot and you lose your discipline, that's what happens. Go ahead. So how do you describe it as a hot market? Is it because well, Oh, I mean, it, this was probably uh, 05, and the economy was going strong. I don't know when, maybe 06, probably 06. You know, uh, deals were hard to find because everybody's, I mean, all the, everybody's throwing money at deals, and, you know, the invested money, capital is easy to get, and economy's booming, and just everybody's paying huge prices, and, you, I mean, you know, you want to get your money out, and so it just... It was a very frothy, I don't know how to say it, but just frothy market where people were overpaying because there was a lot of capital. And, you know, it's the old, when economy's good and real estate prices are going up, people think it's going to go up forever. That's what, that's what this is. Is that just kind of the, like, the people's illusion of theirs and it's a bubble thing? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, this was right, the real estate bubble is what took this down. I mean, the timing, this was in 06 and, you know, it went down from there. It truly went down from there. I mean, this is when, and you know what? We dealt with it for 10 years. So there's the old, you just can't get rid of it. Have you Go. followed the land? I mean, what is Well, we sold it to a, okay, so we bought it from, uh, uh, we bought it from a uh, heir of the Cox Communication family, and it was their ranch, okay, and it was beautiful. I mean, it had yak, you know what a yak is? A big old, it had a yaks on it, and uh, fly fishing, and, um, uh, a horse, what do you call it, stalls. So it was just, you know, their private ranch, and we were going to split it into, did it say how many lots? 89 home sites. And, I mean, this is 1,700 acres, so the home sites are going to be big. And, you know, then we started figuring out the cost to do it, and the market cooled off. We sold it to another individual who's turning it back into his ranch. That's usually what happens. <laughs> kind of stays. And it should have been a ranch the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> now, don't repeat that deal. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, uh, okay. So let's talk about this. I'm gonna wrap up with this because um, I don't have a lot of words of wisdom. Real estate business <laughs> is, you know, you can tell I love the business. I really do. I think it's been a, a great career and 
Um, in fact, the worst thing to me about going to work nowadays as I'm slowing down is that I've gotten further away from the real estate. You know, we're now 30 people and I have a bunch of 40 something year olds now that are doing a lot of the stuff. And, and so I love the business, as you can see. It's a tough business to get into. So I'm gonna be honest with you. There, because there's no structured recruiting process. And you all know this, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, so maybe it's a little tougher to get in, but once you get in, it's worth it. So, you know, you gotta build your list of contacts, all these things that I'm sure they tell you, build your knowledge base, learn facts. And I always tell people learn facts and, and collect opinions because when you talk to me, I'm gonna tell you one story. And when you talk to my brother, he's gonna tell you a different story. So then you gotta sift through the opinions and figure out what's fact, okay? So that's, it, the purpose is not only to network to meet people, but it's to network to, learn the buzzwords and, and the facts. And, and so I always call it collecting opinions because it's not always collecting facts from guys like me. But, um, you know, the industry is, we talked a little bit about this. Obviously, it's cyclical. It's capital intensive, so it's hard to get started, you know, if, if, if you want to truly be entrepreneurial. Um, and it's long time frames. That's the one thing I always say is think about a, the simplest apartment deal six months to buy it, a year to entitle and design. In Austin now, it's like 18 months to design and entitle it. And see, um, two years to build it, one year to stabilize it if you're lucky, and then you sell it. It's a five-year project. And that's a very, very simple. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where, now I have to admit that five years goes fast, and after you've done three or four of them, you look at them and you go, wow, these are really great. You know, I love looking at them and seeing them and all that. My, my kids are totally sick of looking at real estate. I can promise you that. Um, they won't go in the car with me. Um, but uh, so it's a long time frame. So you got to think about that. And then, you know, government, uh, I'm going to try and be kind here. The regulatory environment is getting worse. Okay. They're making it tougher. Uh, some things I would even say in our office, we consider it's almost sometimes what we consider a taking of our property, not a physical taking, but some of the rules and regulations. And Austin's a very, and while we actually think Austin's great with all their environmental regulations, because it it's what makes it great, and it's how you really create value if you can maintain a lot of the environment. But when there's one tree in the middle, we moved a single tree, it cost us $140,000 to move the single tree. Do you know how many trees I can plant for $140,000? A lot. And so, you know, I, I just think government's becoming bi a bigger and bigger part of our industry. So those are things to think about in the industry. Go ahead. Do you think public-private partnerships can be a solution to that, or is it? Um, I think so, yeah. We don't do them because we're probably not patient enough. <laughs> you have to be very patient to do them. And they're very successful. I mean, Miller in Austin is just, it's a housing area that used to be the old airport. It is fantastic. And I mean, it is a perfect neighborhood for families and it's great and all that man it's been going on since i lived there since i first lived there and so we're not patient enough for it we can't you know we got to fund life and all that um but i think there's a definite segment of the market that it's really good for and i think there's a definitely a win-win so i'm i'm for them i just so it's not a business yeah. what i don't know i'd have to think about that i don't have an answer for that off the top of my head See, I'll tell you when I don't have an answer. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I know there is. I just I'd have to think about it some. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you got to think about your geography. You got to think about your product. I mean, real estate's not one business. Real estate's ten businesses. You know, we we tend to be in the residential. I've never done a re retail. In fact, we, I shouldn't say that. We've done one retail deal in our career, and we actually brought a developer in to help us. Never done a retail deal. It's a totally different business. Um, office industrial, and then function. Okay, and so I'm going to roll over into my next thing here. <clears throat> I'm giving you this not to tell you about my company, but more to show you what the functions are, because I think when you go for an interview, it's good to be able to talk about the different functions. Um, so, but I'll start out. We are a very small company. We're about 31 people. We are very entrepreneurial. We started out with three people. We are, there's not much hierarchy. Everybody in my office works with my brother Steve and I, and we're the old guys, okay? So there's not a lot of hierarchy and everything. So we're an entrepreneurial business, so don't compare us to a USAA. Um, there's, I kind of broke our office down in the functions and what we do. And so you can look at acquisitions or investments. Some people love the art of the deal. They want to go out and look for things. They want to build their Rolodex. They love negotiating deals. Um, you know, that, they're going to fall on that. Development, we've got five development people. 
development people always laugh. They tend to be very, very detailed people. And they love the whole concept of things being built, making sure it works, the project, et cetera. But the best, I would tell you, the best developers are detailed people. Okay? They're not, they're not the big thinkers, you know, I want to cut a deal every minute. Um, capital markets is very small. We do a lot of bank debt. Of course, we have to raise our capital from our LPs. Sean, who's one of the principals, she's kind of led that effort over the years. Um, and so there's sort of the whole raising and interaction with the banks and the LPs, et cetera. Asset management, um, you know, I'm not really talking property management here. It's more asset management. It's more managing, you know, anybody we do a JV with, which we're not doing quite as many of, but, but the financial side, monitoring it. Usually the asset manager ends up being very involved in the sale. So in other words, the project's bought and they work on that. So, you know, it's kind of the day-to-day -day operations, the budgets, all those kind of things, staffing, um, uh, financial analysis, valuation. I mean, that's self-explanatory in the accounting administration. So see, we do our own accounting. We believe in kind of controlling our cash. So even when we do a JV, we usually want to control the cash in the accounting because we feel like that gives us control over the asset. Um, the younger folks in our office, the new principals, have started an apartment property management group. We, my brother and I have never done that. Um, they got into it more that we own enough apartments now that it's viable. They're not really in it to, for the money. They're in it for the quality of the service to our apartments. And so they've made a, and that includes people out at the properties and everything. So that, and that literally just started in March. So you can see I'm kind of the part above that in the, the young group is managing most of property management. So, um, you know, that's generally what we do uh, in terms of functions. And I think you all need to think about, am I the person that wants to invest? Am I the person that wants to manage assets? Am I the person that wants to develop? Now, you, you typically don't go in at that level. When somebody comes in and goes, hey, I want to be an investor. I'm going, well, show me your Rolodex. Okay, show me the brokerage group, you know. So in our show, let me, I'm going to see what this next slide says. It, it, it's going to tie right into that first one, okay? We're big on having a strong financial background. And maybe it's because my brother and I both were CPAs, okay? I don't know. Um, but we believe in that. And that doesn't mean you have to be a finance major. That doesn't mean you have to be an accounting major. What that means is you've got to have a logical mind that can run financial projections. Because if you don't understand the financial side of a deal, it just doesn't, I'm being brutally honest, it doesn't work for us. And now, that's just our organization. If you're doing a different role or something, it's just, we consider that very fundamental to our business. Um, so that's kind of our view, but that's not the only view. That's, that's an opinion. Um, and those things can lead to development, can lead to investing, can lead to asset management. That leads out. Now, I know some folks will go into the brokerage because they've got more personal skills and sales skills. And, you know, um, so there, there truly is sort of a whole spectrum here. And I'm really giving you entrepreneurial stuff. You know, banking's a good thing. Going to, I don't know, USAA and working as a financial analyst there or a property manager, those are all great roles. I'm just kind of, I'm handling one little entrepreneurial thing here. Um, but we do like hands-on experience. I tell you, my, I leased our first industrial thing and it has stuck with me my whole life. Leasing, doing the negotiations, fighting over that extra penny for the warehouse, you know, per square foot and everything. So, you know, financial analysis, leasing, property management, construction, all detailed skills that roll into something else. So, you know, I think everybody needs to think about where they kind of fit in that spectrum. Create your detailed level of knowledge, rules of thumb. You know, I always laugh. My development guys can tell you how much a doorknob costs. It's amazing. It's amazing that they can talk about stuff like that. They just, you know, it's that detailed knowledge, you know, performance indicators, you know, over time, different costs for things. You got to kind of build that, that detailed knowledge rule of thumb. I always laugh. So what is, what is the number 43,560? Go ahead. Number of square feet in an acre? Yes. That was the first number I learned in real estate, and I've never forgotten it. Every real estate person should know that there's 43,560. 43,560 square feet in an acre, okay? So there's my lesson for you today, okay? Don't forget that, don't forget that. Um, you know, the other thing is, these are all the things I'm gonna go through. We talked about risk. Uh, you know, the thing about sitting in meetings is uh, you gotta focus on what's going on, the presentation, the negotiation. Remember, a lot of real estate's negotiation, and the only way you learn it is to watch it happen. 
So don't sit in the room as a young person and act like it's not important to you. It's really important to you. Don't kind of watch what's going on and everything. And then kind of being an owner. You know, if you think of it as your money, it's surprising the amount of detail you retain. It is incredible the amount of detail you retain. You know, when we sit in an asset management meeting, it, it really it makes me cringe when you say, so how occupied is that? And the person kind of goes, well, I don't know, I need to check. I guarantee you that if it was your money, you'd know how occupied it was, what, it, what the rent was per square foot, you know, how many people at leases have been done that week. You have to think of it as personal capital, and you just take a different view of, of each asset. Um, add value, become an asset, and then my last one, I always say, you've got to have a passion for real estate. You really do. We, I, I talked to the group earlier. The best thing that happens in our office, and we push so hard, is for real estate discussion in the hallway. Because if you've got everybody talking about different deals and what's happening, and they're talking real estate, not college football, but real estate, in the, you know, it shows that there's a passion or a level of interest for it. So I think that might be it. Questions, comments? I know it was very disjointed, folks, but that's, that's how I do it. Go ahead. Most proud of either personally or professionally? One that I've worked with my brother. <laughs> You don't realize how tricky that can be. Um, oh, I don't know that there's, um, you know, the good thing about real estate is uh, one that we've, and this is kind of a funny answer, but that we've survived 30 years. Real estate is a very cyclical business. And we always say the two key things to surviving in real estate is you got to get good, I mean, and this is very obvious, good real estate, strategic real estate that when the market goes down, that Lakeshore deal, we held through the down, down market, and I forgot what the IRR was, but it was around 20. So we held that through a whole down cycle. Very strategic piece of land. We knew the value was there. Yeah, we had to hold on. So one is the way you survive the down cycles is buy good real estate, and I don't know how you do that, but you do it. And two is liquidity, okay? If you think about it, there are a lot of people that own great assets that don't make it through the down market because they run out of money or cash. They run out of cash. And so when you say liquidity, it's not just your cash balance, it's managing your debt. When we went into the real estate bubble, or, or the crash out of the real estate bubble, we paid down a bunch of loans, partially, to get a two-year extension on all of them, to try and get beyond the downturn. So one is just in real estate, it's being long-term. Um, and two, you do look at, you know, I mean, it's been fun working with all the people we've worked with and, and the assets. One good thing about real estate is you can drive by it. And it's fun. I mean, there's assets. I drive Longwood, eh, not that often, once every couple of years now, but I still like going and looking at it. So, you know, you do build a tangible um, product. So, anyway, not to be too goofy or sentimental, but it's fun. Go ahead. You mentioned, like, treating it like as in it's your money. Is there a what, what portion of your company, like, people who work in your group have equity? <laughs> Okay, here we go, here we go, get to the brass tacks. I, I wanted to talk about this earlier today. So an organization like ours, what happens is you come in, and there's different levels, but, but this is actually a good topic. Um, if you're on the real estate side, um, you usually come in, and we're just kind of a salary and bonus thing, okay? And then after you've been there for a few years, usually what will happen is you'll get a piece of the deal, okay? So you're at the deal level, and that can vary. I mean, you know, like if you develop a project, um, you, uh, a typical thing would be um, you'll get 4% of the uh, back end above an 8 that, that we as a company get, okay? Or, no, actually on the deal, I'm sorry, that's a deal level. There's a different slide. So, you know, you'll start getting back end on deals, okay? Then when you get to the principal level, you actually have fund ownership. So right now, there's really, in the latest fund, there's six people with fund ownership, and there's probably, you know, remember, out of the real estate, I mean, out of that 31, 10 or 11 of them are accounting folks. And to be honest, actually, a couple of those have a little bit of deal ownership because they've been with us so long. Um, but uh, so there's probably six people that have fund ownership and add, I'm trying to guess, probably another six or five or six that have deal ownership. And it's different. If you're developing a deal, you get a certain level. And if you're asset management or it's a rehab deal and it's it's very different and so um that that's kind of how you move up i always tell people don't go into real estate during a salary unless you just 
you, you, you go into real estate to kind of get, but don't in your interview say, hey, so how much of the deal or the company am I going to get? <laughs> it's like, you haven't even shown up for work day one. <laughs> um, I've had that happen more than once. It's kind of like, you know what? <laughs> Can we try it out for a while? <laughs> but, but, you know, you do want to basically, we always kind of go through the process of salary plus cash bonus and then uh, deal level and then fund level. And, I mean, it's just uh, everybody pulling in the same direction. And, and if you think about it, there isn't, there's, well, I was going to say there's a negotiation. When you're, you're negotiating with JV partners over this, but it's pretty much in the company now. They're kind of set. And I hope they make as much money as they do, can because that means the deal is successful. I have my piece of the deal, and my piece is bigger than their piece, so we all make money. But, I mean, I think in a shop like ours, you have to because we don't have the big organization or big bank benefits or anything. And I mean, we have benefits, but, you know, and retirement plans and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's where you get your, that's how you build your well. That's what's my cut of the deal. That's what you just asked. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You have one? Hey, I appreciate it. <laughs>